Hello everyone and welcome to a very special interview from the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith. Before we begin, we have a small favour to ask. We had a host of fundraising activities and celebrations planned to mark our 25th anniversary, but unfortunately these are on pause due to the impact of COVID-19. We remain as keen as ever to continue sharing the best of Irish culture with you, particularly throughout this difficult time, but we do need a little help. If you enjoy today's interview or have enjoyed any of the great content from ICC Digital, ICC on the radio or our culture hotline over the last several months, we would be hugely grateful if you would consider texting 70450 with ICC5 to donate five pounds, ICC10 to donate 10 pounds or ICC25 to donate 25 pounds. Your donation will help support our work in the community as well as ensuring that we can continue to create brilliant content to share with you all. We can't wait to welcome you back to the centre when it's safe to do so. But for now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's guest, actor, writer, activist, and great friend of the ICC, Siobhan McSweeney. Welcome, Siobhan. Hello, Anne. I was just listening to you there. You have a lovely voice. Thank you. Do you think I should go into acting? Oh, come here. Please do. Did you get me a start? <laughs> I, can't get, I can't even get me a start, let alone you, Anne. <laughs> well, listen, thanks very much for joining us today. And it's, it's, it's sad, really, that we can't be doing this interview in person because of, of the situation. Um, but um, I, I wanted to start off by asking you how, how you're getting on yourself and how the lockdown has impacted you professionally and, and and personally over the last year? Ah, well, uh, I suppose every every person has their own individual lockdown story to give, um, but there are sort of common, common things that run through them all. Um, it's hard to believe that it's coming up to a year really, isn't it? And a year ago, I was still living uh, in friends' spare rooms and couches because my flat, I'd had a fire in my flat um, and the renovations hadn't been done. So uh, my landlord sort of snuck me into the flat at the very start of lockdown with the bare stuff done. So I entered lockdown in, in a state of sort of whirlwind anxiety, anxiousness, um, and then was told that I had to shield for three months along with hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so it was an incredibly scary time, an incredibly scary time. We're like, we're on lockdown three. Uh, and now I feel, I, I think we're all just a dab handed it now, aren't we? Uh, we, we have learned to limit our lives somewhat. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I cannot, I cannot wait. I cannot wait till it's over. And then I question if it ever really will be over. But it is tough. Yeah, I live alone and there are pros and cons to that. Um, yeah, everybody has a hard story. Mm. I'm sure mine is no worse or no better than anybody else's. Well, I think, you know, adding in the, the, the fact that your flat went on fire uh, mm. certainly adds to the trauma. And as you said, that you you had no home. You were literally homeless, sleeping in friends' couches. Uh, not to be bringing up the trauma again, but I, I did read that um, it was as a result of um, uh, an, a, a, a cube-shaped adapter, is that right, that was plugged in beside your, your bed and you weren't there at the time, fortunately. No, but... I was watching a play, a Theatre Saves Lives, uh, as, I, as I said, because <laughs> If I had been here, the fumes, unfortunately, would have gotten me before. The flames, yes, it was um, one of those double adopters, a cubed um, thing that you plug into the wall and you put other plugs into it. And I was advised by the extraordinary uh, London Fire Brigade, who were just amazing, absolutely amazing, that they have countless fires started because of them, because they're just badly designed. So it's I would urge anyone who's listening to this to get rid of them. It's not worth. It's not worth it. Get a get a long uh, a dot. Um, I don't know what to call a long extension lead rather than that cute thing. 
um, they're just not, they're faulty designed. So no, that unfortunately, I, I learned that the hard way. You did, yes, but lucky you're still here with us, which yeah. is the main thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and ha are you, have you got a, a new place now or are you still staying I'm with friends? I'm back in the flat with my newly painted walls. Uh, good for the month that's uh, coming up for St. Paddy's Day. I've got the green. Um, yeah, so it's 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 lovely. It's lovely being back home. I mean, this year after that lockdown and after shielding and everything, uh, it's been quite an extraordinary year for me because then um, I did the uh, Great Pottery Throwdown, which was filmed outside of London. Um, in Staffordshire. So I, <laughs> I sort of went from staring at my newly painted four green walls <laughs> to uh, being outside of London in the middle of countryside. And I have recently just come back from Dublin where I was doing a play. Um, so Is this the Samuel Beckett play? That's right, yeah. I did Happy Days uh, from the Olympia Theatre in, in Dublin and it was live streamed around the world for one night only. Um, and then available on demand for another night. But that was a sort of, you, you ask how lockdown has affected me professionally. I mean, there's the obvious things, for example, Dairy Girls had to be postponed. So much filming has to be, had to be postponed or canceled. Uh, plays had to be canceled. Uh, Happy Days is quite a, uh, weirdly, a uniquely, it, 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 it's sort of perfect for lockdown in that it is a two-hander, but it is essentially just Winnie um, talking the whole time. Um, so it is, and, and a play about isolation, so it can sort of be done in a socially distant way, which we did. Um, and it didn't really affect the play necessarily. It affected the production in that we didn't have a live audience. And I, there's nothing more strange than being on a stage as an actor, and especially the Olympia stage, which is such a beautiful theater, looking out on this, you know, gold and red velvet, this archetypical theater scene. And, and of course, the thing about live performance is that you're getting the energy from, from the audience and getting absolutely nothing and having to live in this limbo space, this, this, this in-between place where it's neither screen work, nor is it live performance. It lives somewhere in the middle. And in a way, doing the play has been a dream of mine forever because it's a, a, you know, a remarkable play, but it was also dissatisfying because of that. Because like so much, that lockdown and COVID has caused this, this life in dissatisfaction. It's, 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 it's sort of like, I can't believe it's not life. <laughs> it yes. looks like life. Uh, it sort of tastes like life, but it doesn't smell, you know, like it's, it's, it's um, like diet life, all the taste, none of the calories. Um, yes, yes. And, and in that play, of course, you're, you're, you're fixed in the one position because you're sort of buried up to, your waist and then higher up and so there's a um it, there's a there's a passing of time but yet the past the, the time means nothing it means nothing really and of course that's very relevant to to us now at the moment isn't it because most of the time we forget what day of the week it is oh, i do anyway you know? <laughs> and winnie lives in this place of living the same day over and over and over again and if you <laughs> if you thought that was a psychological stage we're now living in a in a literal reality <laughs> like that um it's a, it's it's a play that really speaks to now well I, I suppose like any great art it speaks to us always in different ways but the similarities between this i mean he wrote it you know, it's 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 part of the abs absurd theatre canon. It's not meant to be taken taken literary, uh, literally. Excuse me. It's more of a uh, a metaphor. Her being stuck is a visual metaphor, isn't it? But we're looking at something that is uh, meant to be a symbol, and it is very much our reality at the moment. Living the same day over and over, trying to fill time, trying to fill time, trying to find meaning in the smallest of things. I certainly found that. I don't know about you, Anne. I I, I really have been struggling with meaning. Really, like if you take away all the external stimuli and all the external connections we have, what is meaning? You know what. 
what, what is it? Is it our families? Is it our work? Who, who, how, you know, if we, and for an actor, if an actor is alone in a room, does she exist? Like, yeah. <laughs> if no one's there to applaud her or to, to dollop praise on her or, or certainly to, to listen to her, like, unlike a lot of other artists, actors can only work with other people. We, we can't go off into a room and do it by ourselves. We're reliant on other people to let us do our job. And I know that um, just my peers in, in, in the acting community are, are struggling deeply, struggling deeply, because it's one thing to lose your job. It's also one, it's another thing to lose your, your ability to create. Um, and there's, there's a sort of a, a sniffiness about actors. You know, people are quite derogatory towards them. They don't, and I, and I understand why, because there's a lot of public perceptions out there that are based in, in falsehoods. You know, we're, we're, we work, we train, it's a craft, we, we work hard. Um, it's not glamorous, we're not looking for uh, praise, we're looking to do our job. And that has been, uh, it's very convenient for some people to dismiss that. I have found, but mm. yeah, my, my sector is really struggling. Yes, absolutely, financially, and not just the actors, but also the people who work behind the scenes yes. in costume and lighting and all the absolutely. relevant apparatus that goes into a production. Very worrying times, that's true. And even though people are being innovative with live streams, it, as you say, doesn't ever, ever make up for the lack of, of the audience and the feedback. Turning from that isolation then into where you have actually been surrounded by a lot of people with very muddy hands <laughs> to yeah. your hosting of the Great Pottery Throwdown, which again is one of these, these uh, things I suppose in, in, this, in these lockdowns where people have turned to uh, craft work, baking, art etc and the pottery is has been phenomenally successful you know the, the, the series has been and I wondered how you came to you know be offered the, to host it I mean how did that sort of come about it was that as a result of you being on the uh, the bake-off do you think that uh, the, with the Derry Girls bake-off that they saw you and liked you and approached you after that yes yes uh, essentially, you're right, yes. Um, so myself and the girls were asked to go on um, uh, on Bake Off for a sort of celebrity one-off thing. And um, accidentally through having a very, <laughs> very stressful and uh, manic time there, I think they saw something in that where they, they approached me then um, sometime later. Uh, if I would be interested in in doing pottery, which, you know, thank God they did, because it's not something I was uh, angling for, you know, as as you can hear, my background is in, my, I, I'm an actor and primarily theatre as well. It's only recently properly with Dairy Girls have I even gone into uh, screen work. Um, my, my bread and butter is theatre. Um, it certainly wasn't even presenting. That hadn't crossed my mind whatsoever. And I'm really, and it, it, it says a lot about the production company themselves, um, what, what smart people they are, um, and also how sort of unconventional they are, how they, they, they understand that one thing can be made into another thing, into another thing. So they approached me and I was only delighted to do it for a trillion reasons. Um, and it's turned out to be, it, it was an incredibly positive experience. I loved it. And the only thing uh, for me, the way that screen work is superior to theatre work, the only way I can say it is, is that you get the joy of doing it twice. You get the joy of filming it. And then six months later or for whenever it gets, you get the joy of having people watch it. So it's almost like a job that happens twice. So it was an incredibly positive thing to do to film. And it's such a gratifying thing at the moment to see how positively it has been received by people. Like I'm getting messages from, from so many people. It, it, it's really gorgeous because it's something that 
I can really stand behind and I feel very proud of, of the team, frankly, uh, because it's, it's, it's just a very genuine show filled with integrity and I'm quite cynical and I think you have to be <laughs> quite cynical. Um, so it's, it's very heartening to see something that is doing well. And you, it's like the little show that could, you know, it's just, it's just mm -hmm. plodding along doing its little thing. And it's mm -hmm. the, the potters are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. The judges are gorgeous and the team were just uh, the production team so supportive and helpful and kind. It's a kind yes. show. Do you get that impression? I do. I do very much so. You've got people from all all ages and all walks of life, and they're just they're not professionals. They're doing something that takes them out of their comfort zone, you know, similar to Bake Off. Yeah. And uh, you're making something, you're creating something, and you just never know. One week it can be a complete disaster, and the next week you can shine. And and you're encouraging you as the uh, in your role there are encouraging and consoling and also occasionally doing a little bit of of um sister michael i think oh really <laughs> well you know potters down tools that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> potters down i think i think there's a bit of sister michael in all of us probably. you have to be you have to be everything i think you know but uh, no i think i think it probably as you say came along just at the right time and it um, gave you that break away from mm. um from 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 acting because i i'm assuming that you you're more or less being yourself when you're when you're there i mean mostly anyway yeah. It's very hard to negotiate that actually, and it's very hard to, um, it's something that people have asked me, you know, about being confident or, you know, oh, I could never do that when they talk about a role I, I would do or whatever. And I'm like, well, neither could I, but I didn't do it. It was the character. So it's very hard to negotiate your persona because yes. I've never asked to be, I have never been asked to be me before um if anything I've been asked to sort of bring me down um so to so my presenter persona I th that's something I'm still figuring out and because I don't know how you have to be protective of yourself don't you you know there's a there's a vulnerability there and and also there's there's something you, you I don't want to expose myself too much so you need to figure out how to present yourself but in a way that is for tea time maybe I don't know I mean I'm probably yes. too sort of pseudo intellectual about it but there's there is something about who about role playing yes um, and the idea of being yourself is such a sort of a paradoxical idea anyway um, yes you're, well for an actor you're, you're maybe anyway role. what's for that sure. especially for an actor because a yeah. lot of people hide behind the rose, I guess. But anyway, we're hugely enjoying it and we can't say too much about it because we don't, uh, it hasn't come to the end yet. Well, for the rest, for the viewing public. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? So That's no spoilers, right. etc. No spoilers! <laughs> no spoilers. Um, so let's see, how, what else do you have on uh, at the moment? Are, are you planning anything? Are you writing anything? Uh, you went on a writer's course, didn't you, to Ireland or one of those creative writing courses? Was it last year or the year before? Um, no, it was a it was a retreat. Um, a retreat, a writer's uh, retreat. A writer's retreat in Kilrealig in West Kerry. Uh, it's um, it's this extraordinary place, just sort of at the side of this cliff. This um, not reconstruct renovated I suppose is the word um famine village so there's these one two three four about five or six cottages thatched cottages dating from pre-famine times that in the 90s I think were renovated and they now uh you now can go down there and use them as as a retreat for writing or for your visual art or for whatever really um and the Listole Writers Week um, very generously um, offered me a place on a week uh, with various other writers, uh, poets, and um, and uh, other kinds of writers, and and we we spent the week down there, and it was it was just before lockdown. Well, it was nearly exactly this time last year, and I'm looking at photographs. You know the way your phone goes. Oh, this time last year you were doing that. Yes, yes. I had no idea. I had no sure. No, you know we we. we 
you never know what's going to happen. And I suppose in a way you can get, you know, that should be a consolation rather than uh, something terrifying. But yeah, I was there for a week and it was so nice. It was so nice to be there. My mother, my mother is from the Bearer Peninsula. And so this was one, two, two peninsulas up. I suppose it is, yeah, two peninsulas up. And um, just, you know, your, 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 your bones sing when you're, when you're in the right place, don't they? I absolutely loved it there. Um, you see that I'm very lucky with my, I'm very lucky full stop. I'm in countless ways, but I'm particularly lucky in the way that my life, uh, I can have a, 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 my flat in, in, in London and live my London life. And yet I have still a huge connection back to Cork and to Ireland and go back so frequently or certainly until uh, recently for obvious reasons um, would go back every month. So I have the best of both worlds. I really have the best of both worlds. I have this exciting, bustling, vibrant, energetic and stimulating city. And then I can go to back to Cork to these um, isolated, peaceful, barren, uh, just as stimulating, but in a completely different way, completely different energy. Mm. And uh, it's all about balance, really. I think, I, I, I often think of, um, you know, when I'm in London, I'm, a, I'm London Irish. Mm -hmm. And when I'm at home, I'm Cork. <laughs> oh, well, the Republic <laughs> of Cork. <laughs> but the idea of, my heart breaks at the idea of people who never went home. When you say never went home, you're talking about a different generation of Irish yeah. immigrants, are you? Yeah, 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 I am. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's I, so, I can only live here because I go home and I can only go to Cork because I live, I live here. Do you know? There's... Yes, I do. I know exactly what you mean. I do. Yes, that's, that's true. Generations that weren't so fortunate, um, no. you know, who came over long long before us yeah. um and you're here quite a while now aren't you you're here 20 yeah. odd years yeah yeah i came over to to train at the start of this century good lord i went to drama school here i was uh, doing a, a science degree in ucc very badly and uh, then in my final year i decided to give up the the fight and sort of relinquish myself into uh, properly applying for drama schools. And I got into drama school over here. I came here and I have been sort of here on and off since then. Mm. Mm. You didn't come from an acting family, isn't that right? No, although that said, uh, my, my, um, I've been, my, my cousins have been forwarding bits and bobs of, you know, my, my, dad uh, was involved in amateur dramatics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was from Cooley, the girl took them in, in Cooley in Balborne. So uh, little pictures of him in the 60s with like talcum powder in the hair and doing amateur dramatics that way. My, um, no, but, but essentially, no, they're, I'm the only odd one. My grandfather uh, was a poet on scenic meow uh, in the Irish language. And so there was sort of that, but I didn't know him. Um, I think essentially it's not really having actors as a background, uh, the arts as a background. I think I come from a very artistic family. It's the viability of it as a career. Um, yes. And I'm probably, even, even my, my grandfather was a, a headmaster, a school teacher, you know, the, the viability of the arts as a full-time career. I am, as far as I know, uh, the, the first person to make it. Um, my my profession. Mm -hmm. I actually have a picture now of my great great grandmother who was a Shanaki. Like so, there's you know, I as they say, I didn't lick it off the stone. No, it's definitely in the blood. Yeah, <laughs> if you go back far enough, you can usually find traces. You know, can't you? Okay. Um, so coming over here, then, um, what can what can you remember about coming over here? Now you say you came over and you got you got into the um, Central School of speech and drama isn't it so what was that like coming over here then uh you'd finished your science degree so you must have been you know glad that you'd had at least the, the degree in the bag mm -hmm. um what was it like coming over here then and and studying acting here and 
what sort of people were you with? What, you know, what experiences can you remember? I was incredibly lucky yet again, because one of my friends from Cork, uh, somebody, somebody told me the stats about getting into drama school. Um, in our particular year, I understand that over 3000 people applied and 20, well, I think only 29 of us graduated, but I think it was 32 uh, were initially brought in. So that, and I was incredibly lucky that one of my friends from Cork um, got into the same uh, course, same mm -hmm. uh, conservatory training. So it, I wasn't as much of an innocent abroad <laughs> as I would have been otherwise because I had a little pal. Um, but coming over here was, <laughs> it was, it was overwhelming. Um, it was fiercely exciting. I remember thinking, how, how, I remember thinking how, how, much I was looking forward to meeting my classmates, thinking that they would be, you know, instead of, you know, when you're doing, if you're in the wrong course and if you're not just on your path in life, you, you always do. And I have always felt a little bit like an outsider. Sorry, there's a, a, a truck going past there. Um, rubbish one. Um, and uh, so I thought that I would get on this course and finally meet like-minded people. Um, and then when I arrived, they did turn out to be like-minded, but sort of initially I was a bit like, I don't, I didn't have the same cultural references. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't have, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but the class system here was a big old slap in the face. Um, there were a lot of assumptions based on my nationality, uh, good and bad. Um, it was just a lot. It was an awful lot, and uh, but I, I jumped. I jumped right into it. I, I absolutely and still do adore this city. I always say the instant I don't see film sets and album covers when I'm on the bus, do you know, like because I turn a corner and I'm like, oh, I'm in a film, or mm -hmm. oh, I recognise that from a Clash album cover or mm -hmm. something. I'll get out of here because it is a, I've seen better people than me be, be worn down by this city. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's any indication of your, of your internal strength or anything, but this is a very tough city. And as soon as I don't get as much joy out of it as I do, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. But I do love it. Mm. After 20 odd years, as you say, that's I fantastic. Know. You know. The longest relationship in my life, yeah. But this Did your friend who came over to study with you stay here as well? No. no. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Isn't he's it? Back, he's back in Cork. Uh, with, he, he's uh, he retrained as a psychotherapist mm -hmm. and uh, he's there, you know, leading a brilliant life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you got off to a pretty good start, I think, because you're it's in terms of films. I think one of your first uh, roles was in uh, The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was back in Cork um, doing a play, funnily enough, in The Everyman in Cork and Ken was uh, filming at the time. And uh, yeah, I, I have a, a very small but enjoyable part in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was my first, first experience. But it's interesting, like even, like even then, as much genuinely as I enjoyed it, even then I was like, God, I hope it doesn't uh, eat too much into rehearsal time at the theatre. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like my, my heart was totally involved in theatre. Yeah. Do you think that most actors actually um, have that bond with the theatre? I think it's got first a, and foremost. Foremost. I think I think probably most actors do, but I think that's down to a variety of reasons. For example, the, the drama training that is it may have changed now. As I said, I'm, I'm, it's a long time since I've been in drama school, but certainly when I was there, um, the focus was on. Uh, conservatoire, uh, classical, theatrical training. Um, and as a result, you know, actors are coming out trained in theatre. 
mm-hmm. more so than, for example, our, our American counterparts who do yes. a lot of screen work. I think also the working conditions in theatre, even though financially they're not as good, <laughs> far from it, but what you do get is that you get to use your craft unless you're very lucky in screen and you're a lead role or one of the leads, usually you're a day player. You go in for the day, you don't really know anybody, you're in your trailer, you come out, you wave possibly, you don't even know which one is the director, you do your lines, you leave. That's that's nothing against the people. People are lovely and it's great and all that. In theatre, you're, you're, you're with people for four weeks, you're watching the whole play, you're part of a community, you're part of a team, uh, not only as an actor, but then during the technical week, you're there with the, with, with the, they call them creatives, which implies that of course that the actors aren't. Um, the, the talent. We're, 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 the, we're the meat puppets, the warm props, I've been told. Um, like with the designers, the lighting designers, the uh, choreographer, et cetera. So, but there's this great, that was the thing that first attracted me to acting was not necessarily the standing up and showing off bit, as they say, it was more the, the putting on a play. Let's everybody get together and put on a play. The, the, the company feel, you have a team, you have a community behind you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you had done a lot of that in UCC as well, hadn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. The drama society there, Dramat, that was essentially where I was the whole time. I did play after play after play. Mm. Uh, it was invaluable, the, 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 the training, the accidental training, because it was all born from passion. Mm-hmm. Um, it, was, it had certainly nothing to do with my coursework. And in fact, it was a huge detriment to my coursework and a cause of, of um, strife at home, because mm. naturally they're going, what are you doing? You know, you're in biological and chemical sciences and, and the first time you're wearing your lab coat is in a production of De Physica, you know, like, what, what are you doing? And so you have to, you had to really, and I was, I was there at a time when just purely by luck, there's, uh, there were a lot of people who are as passionate and continue to be as passionate as, as myself. So we were really throwing ourselves into it and with that feather that only, 20 year olds can you know like a feeling that art is truth and beauty and just like running headlong into it feeling very reckless and of course it was incredibly reckless and incredibly arrogant and all the things that the follies of youth but out of that gang of us there is still a significant majority of us who are who are still working in the arts in one form or another either as writers or directors opera directors producers other actors it's it was really a fertile time and and some a time I look back on with great fondness and a feeling of gratitude actually because I don't think many people get that opportunity it was only by chance that I got that opportunity you know Subsequently, UCC have this incredibly successful and very highly regarded uh, theatre and drama studies department. And they sort of rightly so commandeer the theatre that was there. Sure, we were law department, science department, zoology department, basically set up camp there. And, and it was like, Lord, <laughs> I was going to say Lord of the Flies, but anyway, it was. Uh, so, it's good know. preparation then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, holding on to the conch. It's mine. Um, but we, we, we learned on our feet rather than it being coursework. Yes, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Mm. And there was a lot more to lose. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I just know that I'm a natural contrarian and that even when I went to drama school and I was so pleased to be there and I had such a lovely time. But I was sort of there and sure I'm here now. Um, mm. I, there was no battle to be fought. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I do. I'm now, very Mitch, bold, you see. I'm very bold. You're very bold <laughs> in the Irish sense. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioning the, the 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 way that you were trained classically, and I know you have acted, uh, which people some people might not know if they've only seen you on television. That you have several times, half a dozen times, been in the National Theatre. You've been with the RSC, uh, the Royal Court. Mm-hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. and when you talk there about uh, that community of being in the theater but i'm thinking that in a way was that did that also exist when you did start uh, 
to phone the Derry Girls in the sense that you were an ensemble and by the sound of things, very close. How was it filming and how did you feel about taking on that role of, um, of playing S Sister Michael, the holy nun <laughs> who rolls her eyes <laughs> all the time? How did it come about? And I mean, that you know, tell us a bit about filming that. Um, Lisa McGee is the writer, and mm -hmm. she had written a uh, sitcom previously called London Irish. London Irish. And I had a like quite a few of us had a part in that. Also, uh, Lisa and myself, we knew each other socially. Um, you know yourself, you find your gang uh, and you like I'm not even one gang, there are several gangs, but uh, I have a group of friends, um, Northern Irish friends and, and uh, yeah, we all knew each other and sort of London Irish was, was sort of a, a, a documentary, you could say, rather than a sitcom, but she had been talking for a while about uh, a show that she wanted to write about her, uh, about secondary school. And I remember she did say at one point, I think there might be something in it for you. And I, I swear to God, my first thought was, God, it'd be tough to get back into the uniform, but yeah, I could probably do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Give it a lash, like, I mean, we could add a bit to the hem. Like the hem would be the problem, be the waist. Um, <laughs> totally trying to get into my school uniform, God almighty. But she, 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 she wrote this, the script anyway. Um, she wrote the script anyway, like it's an easy thing. But basically she, she did say, look, I, I, I do think there's a part and she, got me in to read for, to audition for, for um, Sister Michael. And I think it transpires. I always feel a bit dodgy saying this because I never know if it's really true or if it's sort of part of the mythology that is growing up around it. But it has been said by um, the, that, that the part was somewhat written for me. Um, let's just say- you roll your eyes a lot. It was very easy for me to access uh, Sister Michael. Um, I did not, I understood her immediately and I understood the dynamic. And, and the thing about Lisa is because I knew her socially and because I have worked on her stuff before, I also know the rhythm of her, of her work. I know the rhythm of her lines. She's a, a deeply talented, um, a, a deeply talented and technical writer as well. Um, so the flow of her lines, I understood how to access that. People probably have asked you a million times, was it based on a nun from school? That's not the case at all, sure it's not. Uh, my portrayal or the character? Yes, your portrayal, yes. Oh, no, no, she's not, no, no, no. I, I, there, I had no nuns in school and exactly. she's not based on anyone. She's not based, if, if, if she's based on anyone, poss possibly various forms of uh, the female members of my own family and myself and whatever. Yeah, no, she's not based on, on one person. I find actually that uh, in general, I, that's not how I work anyway. Hmm. I don't tend to sort of look at a person and go, oh. I know other people who do, but um, that no. Hmm. It's not based on anyone, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> fortunately, maybe. <laughs> What do you think has been the the um, reason behind the enduring success of Derry Girls? Why does it so? Why does it trans translate in that universal way? I I gather that you get um, uh, communications from people in as far away as Iran. Is that true? Mm -hmm. All sorts of people get in touch and say that they 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 love it. Yeah, I think I think there is. Um... I think first and foremost, it's really funny. Mm -hmm. Like th there's also the fact that, um, so there's sort of a rule that the more specific you make something, the more universal it can hit. So even though this is an incredibly specific situation, 
it has a universal appeal and that people pick up on the universal appeal. As I said, yeah, I've had correspondence from everywhere, South America, yeah, everywhere, everywhere, India, uh, Pakistan, where they absolutely adore the show. And, and I think it's because it's, because <laughs> Lisa has written a really, really funny script. Um, and, and there's something about that time when you're a teenage girl, which is so special and culture, in, in, in our sort of cultural landscape, we don't have many things we can think about. Like the images that come to mind are usually teenage boys, their characters, we can think of what they might be like, or we get this sort of perhaps slightly weirdly sexualized version. Um, there's a certain filter that teenage girls go through um, in our cultural landscape. And this, in my mind, just rips it apart and just has people being people and girls being girls and girls being absolute agents and girls being utterly crap and getting up to mischief and failing and all these things. And, and I also think there was um, an audience for that, a real audience for it. We want to see ourselves in our art, don't we? Um, and I think that she's managed to do that incredibly successfully. And and also, I think that the you know the the, the you know it. I think that the fact that the women are it's very matriarchal society, and the women the roles for the women, um, are are I suppose um, are very strong. Yeah, there are there are, and there is no shortage of people to play them. Yeah. Um, of women to play them. There's a, a surface of incredibly talented um, female actors out there that usually don't get used in or stretched in any way that's remotely interesting. They get to be um, done through the filter of the male protagonist the entire time. So these parts are on the one hand extraordinary because in a way we haven't seen them before and also not extraordinary because we recognize them completely. We all know our mammies with the wooden spoon. We all know our, we always have an Aunt Sarah. We know each one of the girls, like what's really gratifying is seeing the fans and seeing these young women identifying with one of the, the characters, you know? It's really lovely. Um, everybody, everybody asks me about Sister Michael, who she's based on because they're, oh, you must, you must have known Sister, Sister Ignatius, huh? Because it's yes. definitely, yeah. And I'm like, yes. no idea what you're on about. So everybody has those, those, those women in their lives, but perhaps we, we, we just don't see them. And do you think- back to us, Sorry. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, the, the juxtaposition then with the political situation at the time, mm. Um, the 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 continuation of or of normal life as it were with all those yeah. concerns about being teacher while at the back uh, in the background there's a lot of other stuff going on that's very brilliantly done isn't it yeah and you can see that from the view of the outsider then from um, what's his screen name Dylan the the wee English fella. The wee English fella. Yeah. When he comes over and he, you know, they're on the school bus or something and, and the British Army get on the bus and yeah. he's going like this and whereas they're just carrying on as normal. I think that's really cleverly done, isn't it? That kind of juxtaposition of this abnormal situation and the normality of everyday life as people try and keep, keep uh, you know, a semblance of normality and that kind of there's kind of a, a sort of a nobility really in the way you know they're just trying to get on with life no matter what's happening yeah yeah and there's a lot about that time you know what's what's great about um Dylan's part is that he he's the in, he's the viewer from the UK yeah you no know, you 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 get to you get to witness he, he he's the conduit and then with with uh, Da Jerry played by Tommy Tiernan, mm -hmm. you get um, the South, the Republic. That's right. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot about the North, and it's interesting this you know, year with the centenary and everything. Like <laughs> we're all under the banner of being Irish, and people have had very, very, very different experiences under that banner. 
um, and one narrative perhaps takes over many other narratives. And what's interesting about Dairy Girls is that, you know, th this wouldn't have been the primary objective of writing a, a mainstream sitcom, but, you know, it does shed a light on that. Certainly my friends, my, my uh, British friends loved the show, but th they all did mention things like it didn't actually realize there were actual um, soldiers, shoulders, soldiers on the streets and checkpoints and things like that. But, you know, there's, mm. there's a lot of ignorance out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that brings me neatly to my next question, which is that you 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 are very active, I think, in on social issues, and uh, uh, you know you have strong opinions about certain things. And I wondered if uh, if you wanted to talk a bit about that. What are the sort of things that get you fired up that you feel as someone in the public eye that you like to maybe highlight or discuss? Um, I am certainly somebody who has quite a few opinions um, and loud opinions and always have so and I think what was a little bit um, disconcerting uh, and then proved to be nice was um, the, 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 the spotlight shone, shone on me because of Dairy Girls. Um, suddenly me shouting in the corner on my soapbox which I've been doing for years suddenly people are going oh yeah and you're like oh no oh gosh um, not expecting you to listen, except I want you to listen, but maybe not listen to me. Um, so it's been it's been a weird couple of years navigating that uh, sense of being a fraud, really, or something. But I am very passionate about certain topics. I am very passionate about reproductive justice and rights um, for women. I'm uh, an ardent uh, feminist, brought up by uh, an ardent feminist, and I believe that there is a huge amount of work left to do. Um, I think that lockdown has exacerbated and it's very exacerbated um, differences and injustices, um, especially, you know, we're not all in the same boat as everybody says, you know, uh, especially with regards to addiction, domestic violence. Um, the North, of course, I have a huge amount of affection, love for the North of Ireland. And it infuriates me the way the normal, normal, the average person in the North of Ireland, the average woman ha has been neglected so much by Westminster and in a way by the, by the Republic. Um, there's a lot of work to be done um, and lots of things to be angry about. Mm. But I think that, like most things, if you try to find the root cause, it's usually got to do with an imbalance of power. Um, and for me, the imbalance of power is very much rooted between the uh, sexes. Hmm. Well, interestingly enough, we've we've been interviewing quite a lot of um, uh, writers, and there's a huge. Um, resurgence, I suppose, or emerging of talent uh, amongst uh, women writers. Not that it hasn't always been there. There have always been great women writers in Northern Ireland as well as in the South. But at the moment, uh, there's um, and I, I almost said an explosion, but that's not a good word to use. There's a huge uh, variety, shall we say, um, of younger, younger writers, male and female, addressing uh, lots of issues to do with gender and social issues and all the rest of it and that's very encouraging to see we've interviewed a few of them actually for for our next series so you know times are changing hopefully and uh, I mean are they yeah like hopefully I said <laughs> yeah hopefully I think I think there is a lot of there's a lot of going over the same old ground as well like I was having this conversation about uh, it was about Jerry girls you know um just how remarkable it is, female-led, the stories that are being told, blah, 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 blah. And you sort of think, well, every generation, in a way, not to dismiss the absolute incredible achievement of, uh, of, of Lisa, far from it, that's not what I'm saying at all. But like, for example, you think of Sharon Horgan's first sitcom, mm -hmm. Pulling, which was uh, repeated again recently. And I remember watching that first time round and being shook to my core of seeing these 20-year-old, 30-year-old women being losers and being 
failures and all the mischief they'd get up to. And it really spoke to me in the way that comedy, I think, does speak to us on a very uh, far more powerful uh, place because it's an instinctual place. We're laughing, we've no control over it. There's something that really gets to our gut, I think. But every, every generation or every couple of years, we think that we're on, I suppose I'm a little bit, I think a lot of progress has been made. I think the, um, a lot of, you know, one step forward, two steps back, we can see with Trump how easily and how quickly um, somebody with an agenda can undo a lot of the good work that has been done before. We, the fight is far from over. It's not a fight. It, I think it should be a realization that doesn't only uh, liberate women, but liberates men as well. I think the next stage of my personal feminism is about, is about tackling the damage the patriarchy has done to our men, which is immense and huge and deeply troubling. And I think that true liberation and true equality comes from recognizing hurts on all sides, like, like any kind of mediation and, 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 and uh, problem solving. And then we can move on together equally. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's, that's my naive uh, aspiration. <laughs> Can't do much while it being in lockdown, in fairness. I can aspire all I want, but uh, I can, all I can do is walk to the kitchen and back again. Well, I just wanted to 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 mention we, we touched on this earlier when you talked about going to uh, the writers retreat. But have you been writing or have you been able to write or is that the kind of thing that you might be able to address in in writing yourself? Um, I have been trying to write. Uh, it's even before lockdown, it was uh, a relatively new um, venture for me. I think uh, one of the cliches about Ireland that doesn't put my teeth on edge is that you know we, we we do produce an awful lot of good writers but I think as importantly as that is that we are an incredibly literate country um I am always so uh, beguiled by the amount of reading everybody does in in, in Ireland it's a very normal thing to do here it's, it's it's more niche I find and more sort of to do with your identity of who you present yourself as being rather than it being just a natural activity as it is back home so we also know what good writing is and I suppose I've been feeling very um uh, reticent to 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 uh, throw my hat into the ring and say that what I'm doing is good but I have thought well if I don't have to be good and as soon as I took the pressure off me to be good, I have got a few things that I am writing slowly, slowly, slowly. I don't think lockdown is particularly uh, conducive to, you have time and that's the one thing that you say, oh, if only I had time, if only I had time, I'd write all these things. It's not time, it's the right circumstances as well. And it's stimuli. You need to be inspired, you need interaction. We need each other, don't we? It's horrendous to say, but we do need each other. Mm, I think that has definitely been been something that we have uh, discovered. You know, we're social animals and yeah. we do need each other. Um, and uh, I suppose um, the only thing I wanted to say to you now was um, in terms of future work, if you've got anything lined up and um, tell us about that if you have. Uh, no. Okay. Uh no is the short answer You're fully available i'm fully available <laughs> i am fully available i am it's been three weeks now since i finished happy days and i think i'm only now beginning to get out of the fog that mm. accompanied me after that that was a very and and should have, and rightly so was an incredibly demanding experience um and a very yeah very demanding so i'm I'm, I'm very lazy, so I've been enjoying watching, watching telly and uh, doing my crap crafts just to keep you going through the night. You haven't started, to, well, you can't really do pottery in a flat, I suppose. Well, funnily enough, do other I, things. I, started, I started pottery, like, you know, just sort of hand building and stuff during the summer before uh, they'd contacted me about the show. 
truly I, I'd watch the show and I went oh I'd love to try that and I'd sent away for some air drying clay and whatever so people don't believe me when I say that I'm like I actually had but I started embroidery actually I did I did well, that. that's very pretty isn't it yeah yeah I think I'm going to I think I'm going to try some of that it's very meditative as well you just do it well some people are knitting so yeah you know yeah. nothing wrong with with any it's whatever it gets us through whatever. isn't it really Whatever gets us through. through. That's exactly mm -hmm. it. I don't think like be, be it be it that chocolate cake or embroidery or another box set. Let's just get through this. Let's just mm -hmm. get through this. Well, I think on that note, we probably finish up the conversation and at least we can still see you whenever we want on the small screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and we we uh, we look forward to maybe welcoming you in person to the Irish Cultural Centre sometime in the future. Can't wait and, to go back. And thank you so much for joining us today and having thank the chat. You. Thank you so much. Anne. Find yourself there now. Take care. Bye bye.